और इसमें जैसे मैंने पहले भी बताया था मैं रिपीट कर देता हूँ बाकी पार्टिसिपेंट्स के लिए भी कि थर्टी मिनट आपकी टॉक है हम विद नेचर द रोल ऑफ नेचुरल लॉज इन शेपिंग ह्यूमन एग्जिस्टेंस जी तो इसके बाद हमारा दोस्तों का एक पैनल है थर्टी मिनट की डिस्कशन होगी जाहिद इमरोज साहब जर्मनी से हैं और डॉक्टर साजिद खान इस्लामाबाद से हैं अली शहबाज अमेरिका से पीएचडी स्कॉलर हैं फिजिक्स में अभी ज्वाइन किया था उन्होंने दोबारा मुझे नजर नहीं आए तो मीन वाइज वो भी ज्वाइन कर लेंगे तो उसके बाद थर्टी मिनट का क्वेश्चन आंसर सेशन होगा पार्टिसिपेंट्स के साथ जी अली शहबाज आप हैं जी आ गए पंद्रह मिनट से सुन रहा हूँ आपको जी ठीक ठीक नजर नहीं आए इसलिए मुझे लगा था कि आप हैं तो उसके बाद नहीं मुझे मसला असल में ये हुआ कि यहाँ पे इन्होंने घंटा पीछे कर दिया तो मेरा नाश्ता लेट हो गया तो मैं नाश्ता कर रहा हूँ आप नाश्ता कर ले डॉक्टर साहब की गुफ्तु के दौरान पे ये किस यूनिवर्सिटी में है शहबाज साहब मैं नेवाडा में हूँ सर अच्छा अच्छा तो ये हमसे दो घंटे पीछे हैं इसीलिए नाश्ता कर रहे हैं यहाँ तो साढ़े दस बजे हैं डेलोवेर में सो जी जी यहाँ सब साफ है अच्छा तीन घंटे आपका तो और भी पीछे जी जी अच्छा वैसे भी आपसे तीन घंटे पीछे हैं जिंदगी में अच्छा ये जो जो डिस्कशन का सेशन होगा मैं चाहूंगा कि जाहिद इसको कोऑर्डिनेट करें साजिद साहब के साथ भी और अली के साथ भी चूंकि आप दोनों को बहुत अच्छा जानते भी हैं और फिर उसके बाद थर्टी मिनट प्लस माइनस थोड़ा सा हो जाए कोई इशू नहीं है तो फिर उसके बाद वापस आ जाए मेन सेशन के लिए तो फिर हम पार्टिसिपेंट चलेंगे तो डॉक्टर साहब शुरू करते हैं मैं रिकॉर्डिंग हाँ रिकॉर्डिंग ऑन है तो डॉक्टर साहब ओवर टू यू थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू जी I am delighted and honored to connect with your audience, and uh, I'll speak in English. But feel free to please uh, comment in Urdu as well, and in the Q and A section. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to try and keep it to thirty uh, minutes or even less. So the the talk was um, requested partly because. Uh, which is titled earthly order how natural laws define human life uh, and uh, this book um, was published by oxford university press in the us and uk uh, last year but earlier this year i also got a pakistan edition published by oup pakistan so it is much more affordable and it's available in oup uh, bookstores in pakistan also in islamabad in the said book bank last time i was in Islamabad I left some signed copies also if anyone is interested in getting it it's quite affordable and I should mention also I'm donating all of the royalties from this book for environmental education programs in Pakistan I am not making any money from this myself I uh, I've been donating all the money for libraries for other causes in Pakistan so if any of you want to buy it it's for a good cause uh and it's i think like 1200 rupees or something so it's in the in the pakistan <laughs> those of you who are in uh yeah i think mute kar len jo kuch aur beech awaaz aa rahi hai um the uh, also for the students and others who want to uh uh yeah if someone who is managing the zoom may have to do some muting because kai dafa wo phir बैकग्राउंड सर उमेर हंजरा साहब है उनको म्यूट कर ओके हो गए जी प्लीज हां जी सर आप भी म्यूट हो गए हैं अच्छा ओके सो दोस ऑफ यू हु वांट टू कनेक्ट विद मी आल्सो आई वुड सजेस्ट इंस्टेड ऑफ ईमेल कनेक्ट विद मी ऑन लिंक्डइन and follow me on twitter or instagram and so on because it's much easier for large audiences i'm able to keep up with them linkedin i also have a newsletter which i uh, put forward every month so it's much easier because email i am getting more than 200 messages a day and it's very difficult to catch up and then people get offended if i don't reply which i don't want to offend anyone but it's easier to keep in touch that way but if needed of course if it's something very urgent you can reach me by email okay so the book you know i was very honored that the book got a positive reception from a lot of sources and it's really meant to be a, a bridge between the natural sciences 
and the social and political sciences. Uh, what I have found missing is that a lot of what we discuss about sustainable development, about uh, how we are running our environmental politics in Pakistan and elsewhere is often divorced from the natural sciences. And my own roots are in the natural sciences. My first degree was in chemistry. Then my master's is in environmental studies and, in, and within that environmental law and policy. And then my PhD is in environmental planning. So I, I have bridged the 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 sort of what we call the epistemic divide between these uh, fields in my own work. And so I was really pleased that the book got these endorsements from a wide array of people. So for example, a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, Roald Hoffman at Cornell, he wrote a wonderful endorsement, which I'm very honored by. Um, and then at the same time, uh, someone from the business world also wrote an endorsement for the book. Lucas Jopa who was the chief environment officer for Microsoft Corporation, felt that many of the lessons of this book are very applicable to businesses because we need foundational knowledge about some of these issues. And then also policymakers, people like the former environment minister of Brazil, Isabella Texera, uh, also wrote a very positive endorsement. So that's where this book is coming from. And I have been very humbled by this support. Now, what do I mean by order? You know, when we talk about harmony with nature, harmony implies order. And that's why I titled the book Earthly Order. And it's the I use the scaffolding of order as a means of understanding these issues. So by order, I mean the, the two connotations of the word uh, in Greek. Ancient Greek order was thought of both as what we call cosmos, which is the natural order, which our physicist friend uh, Shabazz would understand. The cosmos is the Greek word for natural order. But the Greeks also had another word for order, which was called taxis. And taxis con connotes artificial order or something that is an arrangement that humans might make. And I, I feel that we need to have both cosmos and taxis brought together in how we operationalize our move towards a more sustainable path for our planet, for our countries, for our cities at various tiers of governance. So what I'm interested in is the functionality of order. How do you make order useful? Okay. Okay. बेहतर चलाने के लिए उसको किस तरह इस्तेमाल कर सकते हैं तो वो आप देखिए कि for that purpose I use this example of a library in a library you can organize books either by alphabetical order or you can order them by subject now for most purposes ordering them by subject makes sense rather than by alphabetical order right so order just having order is not enough you have to figure out what is the functionality of that order okay now, if you look at some of the diagrams on sustainable development, usually you find the one on the left where people will say it's sustainable development has three pillars. You know, Islamabad mein hai, SDPI has Sustainable Development Policy Institute, jo Tarek Benori Sahib ne shuru ki and others also. Uh, then there are lots of sustainable development research enterprises in Pakistan. And a lot of the focus has been on these three pillars, you know, economic, social, environmental aspects. And this goes back to 1992 with the Earth Summit. And even before that, the Brundtland Commission, uh, which was started by the former uh, Prime Minister of Norway, uh, which was chaired by her, I should say, uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland. And they came up with this uh, kind of paradigm around sustainability, right? Uh, uh, basically, what happens is that with reference to the um, these three pillars, there is no hierarchy, right? The way this diagram is framed, there's no hierarchy. So one of the goals of my work is to move from that to this more hierarchical system of understanding uh, harmony with nature or earthly order, which is to recognize that natural order is ultimately what the other forms of order are dependent on. So the, the Venn diagram, therefore, has natural order at the outside, and you have economic and social order on the inside. And political order is at the confluence of economic and social order. That is really where, and because uh, Shahid Sahib is in political science, and I'm sure some of the audience members are in that space, 
this is the area of most interest because that's where a lot of the decisions are made. But those decisions are ultimately always going to be subservient to natural order. But we get very removed from that. And that has been my goal is to make sure that we have a more hierarchical view. And one of my concerns has been that in political science, we have talked about world order without looking at this. Now, Henry Kissinger has written 700 page book on world order. And we often use the term world order, okay, the new world order, Naya Nizam ji, dunya ka Naya Nizam. Ab wo jo Naya Nizam hai, usme aap agar jo basic, if you're not going to consider the fundamental laws of nature, it is doomed to failure. And that is what I have argued. And that's why the book is titled Earthly Order, that we have to move from a vision of world order to one of earthly order, which incorporates these hierarchies, okay? Now, the other aspect is this book grapples with this whole field of what we call complex system science. Complex systems are, there's a whole branch of research and it goes back actually to the work of physicists like Murray Gell-Mann, who started not far from where Shabazz Saab is based in Nevada, there is in New Mexico, the Santa Fe Institute, which is one of the great centers of learning on complex system science. That was started by Murray Gell-Mann, who was a physics Nobel laureate, who um, is credited with the um, discovery, or one might say the articulation of quarks, which are a fundamental particle. And he, Murray Gell-Mann was a visionary, you know, he said he was not just a physicist, he was interested in all forms of, of natural order and concerns around it. And so he came up with this idea of an institute that considers complex systems of how complex systems have very specific properties, right? Life is a complex system. And what is complex systems do? Well, some of their properties are very different from what we think of as um, complicated systems. Okay. Often we use the term complicated and complex in the same way, but they are very different. And this table tells you what's the difference. So you can, if you divide the world into ordered and disordered, uh, you have some things which are predictable, right? And there's the simple ones are the very simple things like, uh, you know, a car ignition is a predictable. You put the key in and you uh, switch the flip and you, the car will come on. But you also have complicated systems which have more parts, but they are still ordered and they're predictable. So, for example, a car engine itself has many parts, but it's complicated. It's not complex. Complex is something different. It's a whole different field of inquiry. Um, what's different between a car engine and human life? Why, why did I say life is not complicated, but complex? Because what happens if someone dies, you can try and afterwards put everything back together, but you will not bring the person back to life. Why? Because it is a complex phenomenon. It has certain irreversible processes which happen. It has certain unpredictable pathways that happen. And so complexity is different from complicated. Okay, that's one of the key features of understanding the harmony with nature, because nature is not just complicated, it is complex. You can have some features of a complex system which are complicated, but complexity is a very different phenomenon than just complicated behavior. Okay, and one way to think about it is also, which we say, uh, this is a term we use, you know, uh, the political scientists will remember at one time and U.S. history, there was a, a defense secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, and Ronald Rumsfeld came up with, he made a big speech where he started talking about what is known and what is unknown. And what he was actually getting at, which people misunderstood at the time, was this phenomenon that in a disordered complex system, you can have some unknown unknowns. You don't even know what is not out there, you know, and that's what complexity brings in. So phenomena like uh, our weather, you know, you cannot predict the weather more than 10 days uh, in the future because it's a complex system. You can have great models up to a certain point, which will try to have some predictability, but you will have a point at which you cannot do it, right? 
And then you have also unknowables, which are functionally random. So these are examples. Traffic in a city is a complex system. You can't exactly predict what will happen. You can come up with some models, but they will be limited. Okay. So that's another key feature of this book. Now, what's the, uh, for our physics friends to keep, uh, what's the relationship between entropy and complexity? Entropy is a very important concept in physics, which has to do with the, the, uh, the, the various levels of both information as well as uh, other forms of uh, behavior of the relationship of how much energy is available and useful. Um, so entropy is increasing in the universe, no doubt, but complexity doesn't have a direct relationship with entropy. And one example that is often given, one given by uh, the physicist Sean Carroll at Caltech, which is really nice, is that you look at coffee or tea, you milk tea and coffee with milk. Initially, what happens is you get these wonderful uh, complex currents which form, right? You will see that there's a mixing phenomenon going on, but eventually there will be complete mixing and homogeneity. Now, the entropy of that coffee and tea has increased, but the complexity goes up and then goes down. Once it mixes completely, it goes down, right? So this is what happens with a lot of natural phenomena. With a lot of natural phenomena, you have the same thing that goes on, right? So this is a key feature of this understanding the harmony with nature. You can use the same example with populations and political systems. You will have the entropy goes up when you have migration, but you will get some level of mixing eventually and you get complexity which which will suddenly go down but will it or not you know we have to think about that in terms of what are forces which make come which may prevent it from going down the book also tries to look at these issues from the point of view of both the whether you can have good mathematical uh, uh, approaches to monitor and predict these uh, issues and this is a graph from the work of john barrow where on the x-axis, he has complexity of phenomena. On the y-axis, you have uncertainty of equations, which can predict that. And what's interesting is for our social science friends, who are, I think, the majority of the audience, most of the social science comes up in the northeast of the quadrant. You have very complex phenomena, like how human behavior plays out, how political systems behave. And it's very difficult to have equations about them. Economists try to, but one of the failures of economics is that they are often trying to put equations in situations which are complex and you cannot actually have equations for them, right? And this is something John Barrow put forward in his work that actually with a lot of other systems, like in the case of um, uh, physics, you know, you could have a situation where there isn't that much complexity, but there's very high uncertainty. Quantum gravity, of course, we don't e even have a, a current uh, equation to explain quantum gravity uh, because this is this would reconcile the three fundamental forces of nature with gravity. Uh, uh, the, there are four fundamental forces of nature currently, though they're now saying there may be even more, but um, we don't have such an equation, even though it's not a very complex phenomenon if you actually think about what it's trying to explain. But then in, there can be other situation, chemical reactions, where you have very low complexity and you have very good equations which can explain them, right? Climate ends up in a situation where you have very high complexity, but you can have some, some equations which can explain the Coriolis force, like how cyclones work, uh, but you cannot, uh, but you have high level of complexity. So you cannot explain phenomena beyond a certain a time horizon. But complex systems do have another feature which is interesting. Over time, you have patterns which emerge in complex systems. So one of the great confusions people have with climate change is, why can we predict climate patterns 30, 40 years in the future? Like we're saying, you know, the earth will warm by so many degrees, but we cannot predict weather more than 10 days. It seems like a contradiction, a paradox, but it's not. Because one of the features of complex systems is that even though in the short run, you cannot predict with exactness what's going to happen, there are patterns which form in the very long run, which you can predict to some degree, okay? So that's another interesting feature of complex system. The other thing that's happening in this space a lot is research on planetary boundaries. Trying to understand on the planet, are there certain kinds of indicators which are very difficult to uh, exceed without 
leading to some kind of major planetary collapse, species extinction, or some other kinds of issues. And there is research that has been done by Johann Rockström and at the Potsdam Institute in Germany, and also others like uh, Will Stefan in Australia, Australian National University recently died, um, who looked at this issue of planetary boundaries, and they came up with these boundaries. Uh, and the red indicates that they feel they have been exceeded. Okay, so you have nitrogen and phosphorus loading, which is nitrogen and phosphorus are really important elements in uh, in uh, living systems because some of the molecules in our body through which we produce energy require them. Like phosphorus ATP is the basic molecule which provides energy transfer in cells that has phosphorus in it. And so phosphorus is really important for living things. Um, land, conver land conversion to other feed, uh, areas, uh, so taking away useful land and making it unuseful, biodiversity loss, these have been overshot. The other part of this diagram shows the social side. The outside is the natural science side. The inside is the social science side. So this is the social foundations are like what people need, education, health, food, and so on. In order to provide the social, you need to have extraction of the, the natural resources. So what do we need? We need a balance between what the planet can tolerate versus what we need minimally to have a socially functional society. So what happens then? You need to operate within this safe spray space, within this green area, and the, the economist Kate Raworth at Oxford has used this concept. She calls it donut economics. This is a green donut. <laughs> you know, donut, you know, the bakery that you get. Basically, you are trying to operate oops, within this safe operating space where you don't exceed the ecological ceiling, but you also don't go below the social foundation. So that's what a lot of research now is going towards is how do you operate within this safe operating space for humanity? One way to do it is through these adaptive cycles and they're called panarchy cycles. This is a painting of the Greek god Pan in the you know Greek mythology. They have the Pan was the god of nature. Since we're talking about harmony with nature, of course, uh, you know, this is all kind of uh, figurative, but it's a nice way to think. And Pan had this strange, the Greeks thought that Pan was half goat and half human, <laughs> uh, just to add some humor to the conversation. But Pan, the, the word, Pan was also a very problematic god for the Greeks because Pan was constantly in contradiction because, and, and the Greeks recognized this, you know, that just like we have this tension between the social foundations and the planetary boundaries, the Greeks were constantly concerned about this with Pan. And Pan, the word panic, you know, in English, panic comes from Pan. And that shows that, you know, there is this tension when we say there's panic. Um, so what, how do we reconcile this? And this was the work done by C.S. Holling and Lance Gunderson is that we go through these cycles, they're called panarchy cycles where you, you go through, and I won't go into the indicators that are used here, like alpha and kappa, omega, but these are uh, indicators like carrying capacity we use in ecology to measure uh, our resource usage. But you go through these cycles and you adapt, you learn from each cycle. And that's how you are able to find a way to live within that safe operating space. And the book discusses ways in which we can do it. There are also conversations about sustainability of whether we have non-renewable resources or renewable resources. And there's this notion of weak sustainability where you're taking natural resources and converting them to other forms of capital, like financial capital, uh, versus strong sustainability where the natural resources can be naturally replenished, like trees, forests, those are naturally replenished. Minerals, they are not naturally replenished, but you can use them to make other forms of capital like buildings, which could then be re replenished. You could recycle the buildings or you can make financial capital from them. So there are there these there are ways in which you can take one resource and convert it to another, but sustainability research is divided between weak sustainability and strong sustainability. Now, design is, we, we also talk a lot about in the book about design. Like one way to live in harmony with nature is to look at design and planning. And 
So I, I, I use this example of the garden city concept, which goes to the 19th century. And this was the example of how you would, uh, Ebenezer Howard came up with this idea of having cities where you had this hub and spoke model of trying to live in harmony with nature, where you would have reduced resource usage. There have been other designers, urban planners who have made very bizarre urban plans, which have not been very helpful. This is a map of Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, which was designed like an aeroplane by, by Oscar Niemeyer, the architect. And he wanted to design it that way because his wife died in a car accident and he was really worried. He thought, I want a city where you have minimal car accidents. And so he made this bizarre design, supposedly that you have less intersections to have car accidents, but it was not a very sustainable design from the point of view of resource usage. Now, there is a Pakistani connection to this is because one of our you know, great cities, Islamabad, was designed by Constantinos Doxiadas. He was the great Greek urban planner uh, who, design, who designed uh, Islamabad's master plan was done by Doxiadis. And he is considered one of the founders of environmental design and more sustainable design. He came up with this notion of achistics. And this is what achistics means. And if you look at, uh, and you can look this up, I'm rushing through this so we have time for your discussion. But um, uh, one of the, the features of Islamabad, which is uh, comes from achistics, uh, is that he wanted there to be this connection between networks, nature, and society. And so if you look at Islamabad, the way the sectors are designed by Doxiadis, it's to minimize transport usage, uh, to maximize pedestrian usage. That's why you have a markaz in the center. You have, po you have poly markazes, you know, you have the central markaz, then you have each subsector has its own markaz, which is to reduce car usage. So people can walk to markets and have, so it's actually what, and he called it his masterpiece, you know, so Pakistan should actually take pride in Islamabad and use it in a better way. Unfortunately, we have Ganda Nalas running through all of the different sectors, which is a pity because we didn't invest in sanitation, which we should have. Otherwise, it's a wonderful city, but you, we have not invested in sanitation. But that was not what Doxiadis envisioned. The, the basic plan was very, uh, was very progressive. So take home messages of the book. Patterns raise useful questions, but not always useful answers. Natural order is ultimate, the Venn diagram. And humanistic order is proximate, which we need to consider. The third is that transitions in and out of order are not always reversible because we're in a complex system. You can have a tipping point after which you may not be able to come back, just like death is a tipping point, right? So similarly in nature, we have to plan for that. And political systems need to advert to it. You know, sometimes you are like, ji, hum intazar kar lenge. Pehle hai paas itna data nahi. We have this problem, what we call paralysis by analysis, right? So how do we find a way so that we don't go over the tipping point? That's part of having a more functional society. And then earthly order can both be discovered and invented. I'm not one of those kind of impractical environmentalist who just says we should just conserve nature uh, without foresight, foresight for what happens for humans. I think we need to both discover natural order, but we can invent it also. We can have cities, we can have technologies which can help us. And this goes back to remember what I told you about the Greek vision of the two forms of order, cosmos and taxes. You can have the cosmos and discover the natural order, the patterns in which uh, earth systems function. You can design buildings even through what we call biomimicry, you know, mimicking nature, but you can also invent order through technological development and so on. And so the last chapter of the book has this diagram which shows basically that we are at this crisis point. We can either evolve into a more complex and more sustainable system, or we can fragment and move into a less complex fragmented system. And this could be a, you know, a dystopian outcome, but we mm -hmm. hope we will make the right decisions and move more towards this outcome. So with that, one sentence summary, if I were to summarize my argument is, to meet contemporary challenges of human sustainability, we need to meaningfully connect political notions of world order with the natural constraints of what I call earthly order, okay? 
and I'll finish there. I'll just leave this these two quotations. For, this quotation is from those of you who are science fiction fans will appreciate the Dune saga. This is a quotation from Frank Herbert um, about you know how how we need to reconcile the way we think about the, the the universe, which may seem logical at one level, but in a complex system, you're always one step ahead in terms of going beyond logic sometimes. And that's what we have to plan for in, in how we work through these things. All right, thank you so much. Dr. Shukriya Aapka, thank you very much. Or हम जो है ना थोड़ा डिस्कशन की तरफ चलते हैं जाहिद साहब को हमने इसलिए एंगेज किया कि जाहिद साहब जो है मटेरियल साइंटिस्ट हैं और इसके साथ साथ जाहिद साहब जो है वो शायर भी हैं और सोशल साइंसेस में भी इनका इंटरेस्ट है तो वो जो मैं मैंने आपकी फॉरेन किताब खरीदी और इंट्रोडक्शन मैंने पढ़ा तो मुझे लगा कि जिसका जो साइंस पार्ट है उसके लिए हमें कुछ दोस्तों को और दोस्तों को शामिल करना चाहिए ताकि वो हमें थोड़ा सा ट्रांसलेट करके हमारे लिए अंडरस्टैंडेबल बनाए इसको तो ओवर टू जाहिद इमरोज जाहिद साहब ओवर टू यू थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर ज्वाइनिंग या बहुत शुक्रिया सबसे पहले तो सलीम साहब का बहुत शुक्रिया कि उन्होंने गेव अ वेरी कॉम्प्रोहेंसिव ओवरव्यू ऑफ द होल बुक ऑफ कोर्स एक किताब में इतने ज्यादा मौजूद होते हैं इतने डिटेल सर आवाज बहुत हल्की है अभी ठीक है जी ये सब थोड़ा ला हाँ सो so, मैं अब करीब होकर बोलता हूँ आई थिंक यहाँ पे कुछ कैस्टिक्स का मसला है सो so, <clears throat> पहले तो सलीम साहब को बहुत शुक्रिया कि ही गेव काइंड ऑफ अ बर्ड्स आई व्यू ऑफ इज दिस वेरी डिटेल्ड वर्क ऑन दिस टॉपिक सो सिंस वी आर थ्री पीपल एंड आई डू मटेरियल साइंस एंड ऑफ कोर्स दीज आर ऑल द क्वेश्चन ऑफ कंसर्न हाउ टू कम अप विद नॉवल मटीरियल विच आर सस्टेनेबल फॉर द एनर्जी सो प्राइमरिली आई इफ आई गिव माई पर्सनल रेफरेंस आई वर्क in the in organic uh, chemistry department where we work with the novel materials which improve the efficiency and then bring more organic or recyclable materials replacing lithium ion batteries or going towards more of a environmental friendly alternatives let's say sodium or potassium or more alkaline alkaline earth metals so of course this is a there is a strong drive in western academia and western industry let's say to some extent Uh, European industry is trying to move away from this more polluting hydrocarbons. There is a resistance, but of course there are efforts as well. So is the US. US has had a huge drive for the last maybe thirty years. They were more serious, and now China also very seriously jumping in to minimize the impact in re like reducing the carbon emission, finding alternatives, and that eventually is creating a harmony with nature. To of course you cannot stop the activity. but you can lead or drive this activity towards less climate damage approaches and i think you very nicely used the historical references the understanding from the the greek all the way to the the modern times how this material science research also the research of economic political and uh, socio economic spheres that how we can come up with the more sustainable designs either is a city planning or inventing materials or it is uh, playing with the nature in a way that you manage to minimize the the fall out or the the climate crisis though at the same time i am very sad all these developed countries still heavily rely on extremely polluting industries including the weapon industry and now we see what is happening in us in israel palestine in russia and ukraine you maybe minimize the carbon emission by cutting down the the, the traditional fuel based cars but when you launch 1000 rockets maybe you basically destroy half of a city and then your carbon emission goes out of control and this again i think is an important point to to bring to the table how this climate change can be tackled if you still continue fighting and utilizing these extremely polluting sources so now i don't want to do a speech but i just wanted to build a context for our second part of the of this meeting and i think i do have some questions some observations but i think i will ask maybe these questions or share my comments but maybe loop in shahbaz and sajid as well if they have questions i would prefer that they start and then we continue our conversation 
Thank you, Dr. Zahid. So, Shehbaz, if you, if you Shehbaz, want to start, good. then please. Uh, yeah, um, thank you for this uh, talk. And uh, since uh, Shasa actually contacted me about this uh, discussion, I was uh, looking at your book and then your videos, you know, you, you were invited by the black hole and discussions elsewhere with Oxford University Press and stuff. And then you were talking about some books. Then I borrowed those books from library and start looking at them. So I'm just the beginner um, uh, in this uh, discussion. But I have uh, uh, one question. I am a theoretical physicist. Um, and although our ultimate goal is just like uh, Zahid, we will also uh, be looking at materials which have all these properties. Uh, but because I'm a theoretical physicist, so my concern is with actually order. So we are studying topological order. Uh, you may have heard about topological materials. So we are trying to understand topological order, which people have, and we can have high superconductivity, high temperature superconductivity with uh, topological order. But me and my group, uh, we are studying actually disorder. And we are using uh, Giorgio Parisi's uh, complexity theory and replica theory and all these <laughs> things that you were mentioning. Uh, but when I look at uh, uh, order and disorder, even disorder um, seems to be kind of an order. You can say that although we call it complex systems, but we are still trying to find the patterns and orders uh, to study the disorder. Like we just put the disorder in our system and speaking mathematically, and then we solve it just like, you know, uh, we would solve equations for completely ordered system, uh, crystals specifically. So um, this is one observation. The second thing is that um, when you transition from natural order and then you talk about social order and political order, that's where I'm lost. I am trying to understand how are you connecting social order or political order, because in my mind, the term social order and political order is completely different than, okay, on a meta level, you know, metaphysically speaking, the word order or the cosmos and all these, you know, arrangement of things make sense. But when we look at the real world, I see that the social world is completely, if, if not completely, but it's very chaotic. It's not ordered. I don't know any equations that work for economics or, or sociology or these kind of things. So how do you connect social and political order with natural order? Okay. Um, that's great. Yeah, I can address that. Um, so first of all, with reference to uh, your observation that ultimately disorder can also form some form of order that goes back to what i was saying about the um the weather climate paradox you know where eventually what happens is that you get attractor basins in complex systems where you can get some patterns that emerge and that that that, that is something that we should look at but it, the main issue there is time you know so you have to then give that uh, iterative process you know even the work you do computationally in physics many times you have to then run these equations repeatedly and see what happens there but as long as you are aware and we need a lot of computational uh, power to do it and the book actually has a section where i talk about you know computational limits also around what is happening we talk about like how because entropy is apart from the physical manifestation of entropy there's information manifestation of entropy also right and so if you read that part of the book, I go into that and I link it with computation. And that's why computation requires so much energy, right? You have these big server farms and all which require energy because ultimately even to process information, you need energy. So um, 
so that's part of what I'm saying when I say we have to plan for it. Even that is constrained by natural systems because we will need energy to run the server farms. That was the problem with Bitcoin. You know, with Bitcoin, ultimately you are generating. Why is it that the Bitcoin currency is generated is you need a certain trust factor. The trust requires an algorithm that has to be run and verified by multiple computers. <laughs> And then you get the Bitcoin. And so you get that. That's where they were putting these huge server farms in Iceland and places where you have cheap energy. So there is this interesting connection between physics and information theory and computer science, which I also cover in the book. And that may address that aspect of what you're talking about in terms of equations and what you can get. The second observation you have made um, with reference to how do you go from natural order to social and political order. You know, this is what we call, talk about also in terms of power laws. And there's a wonderful book around power laws if you're interested by Jeffrey West called Scale. And uh, Scale, Jeffrey West was the president of the Santa Fe Institute and he's a theoretical physicist like you, Shabasa. But he ha in Scale, he talks about how using power laws, you go from natural systems to social systems and so on. So if you think about a city, you know, a city has individual agents which are acting. They're individual people, there are cars, there's so on. They, you can think of them like particles in some ways, you know, and their actions are chaotic in, in terms of how they uh, operate. And so a lot of those, and, but, but you're absolutely right that there are limits to the analogy, right? Because those agents are going to make certain changes and 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 make some uh, behavioral uh, decisions which are not necessarily like what a quark would do or uh, and so on. But at some level, there there is going to be some relationship there. And so that's and the book tries to I caution the fact that you can use you, you they, they operate by some similar laws of nature, but they try to subvert those laws. And when they try to subvert those laws, you run into trouble. So that's when cities become unsustainable sometimes. You know, you have urban sprawl, which happens and so on and so forth. So um, so I, tr I try to make that connection through the notion of power laws and so on. And I would urge you to consider, and I talk about, you know, Jeffrey West's work in there as well. But chapter four of the book, tries to make that transition and explain how natural order gets connected to social order. Okay. Yeah, very nicely Thank explained. You. And I jump in again, if you don't mind. So just like continuing the same uh, comment that uh, you made, it's very interesting. I think this is what Shehbaz, I think, tried to say in the beginning that how this the intra-human order has a very different definition what happens in the nature where you can predict but however, I think what uh, uh, Mr. Slim is trying to make a point is that how this Anthropocene interact with the nature, our nature to human correlation of uh, this relationship should be should have an earthly order. So we should not go against the the nature or the way we conceive the the our relationship with the nature should have some inter internal harmony harmonious relationship. So we sh when we go beyond that, we see this chaos and this uh, out of control uh, production of the, the pollution that mess up everything. So I think what I would like to add my observation while listening to your presentation. So you made these two, three uh, uh, comments by explaining through the, the diagrams, for example, the realm of order and the disorder, and you use this the order is a known phenomenon and the entities are mostly known, conceivable, mm -hmm. and the disorder is the unknown and unknowable things. So what basically yeah. we do, our whole quest is to somehow personify the unknown and eventually bring the unknowable into the knowable sphere of our understanding. So you basically bring something be from beyond conscious to the conscious, then it becomes known and then you once it is known then also it becomes inherently ordered and i think and this the graph of the of the complexity eventually turning into a simplicity by this homogeneity again i think it's a very good a very good uh, visual to explain that 
And also, I yeah. think what well, one is, just one sorry, uh, Doctor Zaid, just one slight clarification: <clears throat> the unknown. You want to make the unknown to the known. The yeah. unknowable you will maybe will never be able to. So you have even in physics, you know, the you think like the uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, or you have you know Gödel's impossibility theorem, and all which talk about certain things which we will never be able to do cognitively because there are physical constraints to that. But you're right, from unknown yes. to... Yeah. Yes, but I think I, I still see it in a more optimistically that this unknowable is also not like uh, in untouchable territory. So what mm. is unknowable for a person 4,000 years ago is now, I think the sphere of unknowable is also shrinking. Yeah. So from it's unknowable, possible. it comes to unknown, and then someone takes an intellectual leap, and that unknown eventually starts taking a shape through some mathematical or sociological theoretical models. So that's possible for some yes. things, yes. But yeah, for yeah. example, for example, like a knowing, uh, maybe a man of four thousand years ago had no idea what was beyond the planet Earth, and for them, the world was just this tangible planet and then eventually this unknowable also shrank and then this is i think it's more porous however no, you're right but, but that i would classify that as unknown not unknowable because it was not un, it was unknown because we didn't have the ability to get to it but there are some things this is where there's also research on you know sort of the the end of science or so like are we reaching a point where we have covered a lot of the fundamental laws of nature we understand and so on and so there are certain now and that's why i use the example of girdle's impossibility theorem and heisenberg's uncertainty principle that we now have clear evidence that certain phenomenon especially in quantum mechanics it's it's not possible to actually know <laughs> you know yeah, where, I totally agree. yeah, you yeah, know, yeah but sure. it's, so it's just that part but i understand what you're saying yeah. but i would put that in the unknown category not in the unknowable category yeah okay so i think it's just a matter of interpretation how where we put the the threshold so yeah. for example this uh, the time and energy or the position and momentum you can never solve this problem you cannot yeah. know both at the same time for yeah. sure and now, now, again, one observation which I had is, and also I will put in as a question. So what we, we are doing through employing this artificial intelligence tools, and we are doing running this statistical analysis because we have more computing power. And now we see the patterns being recognized by the computers, by the algorithms, and these man-made machines. Then we know more possibilities within this realm of unknown and then we see this whatever it was unknown now we can see kind of a shapes emerging and that help us to understand comprehend more complex phenomenon and that complexity eventually then being simplified once it is conceived then it is also seeable so my question is that now you when you say that through this diagram you showed where this uh different variables, which some are beyond control and some are within the control. So one thing is taking place, we cannot cease the economic and industrial activity. It is happening, the more robots are required, more machines are required, so more pollution is being produced. We are trying to solve the, the collateral damage, climate collateral, collateral damage as much as possible. But when we talk about sustainability, how you con conclude, I'm sure you must have some suggestions by end of this book, but, but for this audience, if you could comment a little bit on that. So what are the ways beyond what is already being discussed? What should we do to create more earthly order? Yes, sure. No, thank you so much. And, and you know, in terms of your work in material science, one of the clear ways in which I, what I've tried to also do is be very practical uh, about giving um ideas on what we need to do in what i call the material energy nexus a lot of my own research is around minerals and extractive industries and environmental and social impact of uh, the extractive industry so one of the ways in which we might apply these principles is actually doing more life cycle analysis around 
what kind of materials we use for different kinds of uh, construction and so on and so forth. I also feel that we should be using concepts like power density to make decisions on what kind of energy sources we use. So in the book, for example, one I, I, I am someone who is very open to considering nuclear energy as a resource. Uh, I'm not, I, I say I'm not for or against. I'm just saying that there is enough evidence to suggest that because you have very high power density with uh, nuclear fuels, that they do have the opportunity to provide us with a more sustainable future, especially with reference to carbon emissions, and that it's been more a social amplification of risk that that we as humans have had against nuclear power that has led to some very um, bad decisions in some cases, like in Germany, the decision to phase out nuclear power very precipitously uh, after the Fukushima disaster was uh, what led to them being dependent on Russian gas. And, you know, eventually even now they're going to delay their transition to uh, decarbonization by many years because of that decision. Um, so, you know, I try to say, look, here are the science-based metrics which we should use that are predicated in the laws of nature, and that will help us to make better decisions on sustainable uh, outcomes in the long run. Um, with materials also, similarly, you know, whether you choose wood versus metals. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have even questions. One of the things I tell my students is the even the notion of um people say, well, you know, metals are mined and so they're non-renewable. I say, well, actually, you're taking the metal out of a, uh, from a physical perspective, you're taking it out from a high entropy state to a low entropy state. And then if you design products which are more modular and you are able to take them apart and you can remanufacture them or recycle them, then they are renewable. You can't just, you can't talk of it whether you can grow it or not. It's more about the entropy than anything. Similarly with nuclear waste, if you use the concept of entropy or exergy, which is an even more useful concept, um, then you find that even though nuclear waste is hazardous, it's low entropy waste because it's all in the same space. Whereas if you burn something, you are creating very high entropy waste because it's going out into the atmosphere. You can't bring it back easily, even though now they're trying to do carbon capture and storage and all these other things. Um, so I, what I try to do is I provide that kind of foundational learning from the laws of nature, which will hopefully inform better decisions, which are not emotional decisions, but they are science-based decisions. Yeah, for sure. That's a very nice comment. So I think now diversifying our topic and the time is limited. So I would also like to loop in Sajid Khan, who is a political scientist. So maybe he has uh, the different perspective on uh, what we are talking about. So now I would ask Sajid Khan, please, uh, stage is yours if you have some comments or questions or something to share with us. Thank you, Zaid, for allowing me. Uh, thank you, Salim, sir, for a wonderful talk. Uh, uh, no doubt, during recent centuries, human developed great capacity to extract more resources. Obviously, human intelligence facilitated humans to start their development trajectory and obviously, we, gradually, human intelligence basically uh, facilitated uh, humans for extraction of more resources or for the utilization of the more resources. For, for, but at what cost? As you have referring that, uh, there is an earthly order which is linked with other political social orders. And that is based on, uh, that is very simple to some extent. And then at the same stage, it is very complex as well. Uh, so humans emerge as a most efficient killing machine of that natural order. Uh, obviously, they are working on the political orders requires the defense expenditures to defense against the state, other states. But ultimately, at what cost? We are going to develop our destructive capacities and that destruction is going to disturb that natural harmonious relationship between the these orders uh, so uh, and we, we are talking about sustainable development or sustainable growth but that 
sustainable growth or sustainable economic development can undermine our sustainable existence. So, obviously, on the other side, the unknown factor, we have a limited knowledge of unknown factors, uh, that university is so complex, so vast, no doubt there was a human stake, great intellectual leaps during last century as a Ambrose was referring. Uh, but these were just the small steps when we are uh, trying to understand the complexity of this universe. Then there is realization is coming to us uh, that uh, the vastness, the complexity is more. So with this limited knowledge or limited understanding of that earthly order, to some extent we are able to understand and no doubt that there is no comparison between the humans of 4,000 years back and humans of this time. Uh, but ultimately, probably we need more holistic picture to understand that knowledge or complexity. Although simplicity is there, there is a balance, there is a harmony. But uh, that harmony, uh, to understand that harmony, we need to understand that complexity. And without understanding complexity, we are suggesting certain solutions which are not ultimately going to work. Uh, so, kindly enlighten us on that issue that the political orders and economic orders had different goals while the earthly orders require certain different goals and how we can maintain balance between these conflicting orders. Yes, no, I, absolutely, sir. It's a, that, that is one of my goals in writing this book is to make sure that politicians recognize that they are ultimately constrained by uh, natural order. Now, how do we operationalize that? That's a good question. I mean, I think ultimately you need a much greater education among politicians about the natural sciences. Uh, we have been actually in, in America, we have the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which has been aiming for getting politicians trained in basic fundamental science, which they don't have, and to encourage scientists to go into politics. Right now in America, 60% of Congress is lawyers, you know. So the people who are making decisions, they don't understand the stuff. That's the problem. Um, if increasingly, if you get that shift more for that informed uh, politician, that I think would make the difference to some degree because people would recognize the constraints that are there uh, and they would make decisions accordingly. Um, the other option is that you empower the technocrats more. So the politicians do what they're doing, but then they give more authority to technocrats around decision making. And the technocrats are not elected. The technocrats are appointed based on their, uh, their decision making power. And in the book, in the third part of the book is political order. I actually compare China and India in that regard. Because China, you know, is uh, it has developed its political system around Confucianism in the last 20 years. Not before that. Before Deng Xiaoping, Confucius was actually rejected by Mao and others. The earlier leaders of China after the Communist Revolution, they did not like Confucius. Um, they had a, a populist vision of, uh, uh, of poverty alleviation, which uh, led to, you know, huge mistakes. As you know, the Cultural Revolution was a huge mistake. So many people died during that time. But Deng Xiaoping brought in Confucian thought. And one of the core aspects of Confucian philosophy is technocracy. You make decisions based on expertise, who knows the best in terms of the knowledge base. And you will see a lot of China's decision making has now taken that turn. Now, it's the, the problem is that they, they have also stifled democratic enterprise completely. You can have technocracy and democracy. And they have felt that they can only have technocracy without democracy. So that is one of my solutions from a political perspective is that you find that hybridity between technocracy and democracy. India, on the other hand, went completely the other way. They went to democracy and populism. Uh, and they have actually undermined technocracy completely. And that has led to a lot of their current problems. As we know now, uh, environmental concerns, huge issues, but also the greater level of inequality and so on. Um, so they have been able to empower and develop a certain sector of society at the expense of others because the technocracy has been undermined. 
Um, so while we can applaud the democratization of India at one level, and we can applaud the techno technocratic development of China on the other level, we need some hybrid of, the, of both. Maybe Pakistan will deliver that hybrid. I don't know so far. <laughs> Let's see what an archivist rule here. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have taken enough time, and now as uh, half an hour was given to three of us, I think I will now hand it over to Shahid Saab again. If uh, other people have questions, so we should loop them in. And also, I have said that I will shift to Urdu. Now, all the conversations are in English. So, yes, yes. So, now we have our language of Lingua Franca, and this is a matter of time. So, Shahid Saab. Yes, yes. So, Shahid Saab. उर्दू में एक किताब के ऊपर मैंने उर्दू पे भी एक डिस्कशन किया था वो एक है इनका प्रोग्राम कायनात की चाय I don't know if you have seen it. Okay, so I have also done a discussion in Urdu. It's only in Urdu. Kainati Chai. Kainati Chai. Kainati Chai. Kainati Chai. What's your name? Salman. Salman Hamid. Salman Hamid. Now Urdu Chai is only for water. Let's go. Let's ask someone who has a question. Who is the rest of the friends who are with us at this time? बहुत अच्छा लगा सब कुछ बहुत इन्फॉर्मेटिव था आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू नो के एज अ कॉमन पीपल जो इंडिविजुअल है जिन्हें ये सब नॉलेज नहीं है हाउ दे कैन हैंडल देयर इन्वायरमेंट कैसे बहुत ही बेसिक और इनिशियल लेवल पे एक इग्नोरेंट और इलिटरेट पर्सन कैसे अपने माहौल को बेहतर बनाने में कंट्रीब्यूट कर सकता है एक तो ये चीज दूसरा ये कि रिसेंटली आई वाज स्क्रॉलिंग डाउन माय फेसबुक जब मैंने देखा वो लिक्विड ट्री के बारे में डू यू हैव एनी आइडिया अबाउट दैट कि वो किस हद तक वो हेल्पफुल हो सकता है या आई जस्ट वांट टू नो कि अगर वो एप्लीकेबल होता है तो पाकिस्तान के इस पॉइंट पे खड़ा है कि क्या हम उसको कभी अपने यहाँ सिस्टम का हिस्सा अंडरस्टैंडिंग होगी या नहीं होगी सर ये दोनों चीजें बताइएगा जी अच्छा जरूर थैंक यू जी ये जो एवरेज पर्सन का आप कह रहे हैं ना एक तो हम एवरेज पर्सन पे इतना बोझ नहीं डालना चाहिए हमें क्योंकि वो दे आर अपनी वो जो मतलब जिंदगी के बेसिक नीड्स को मीट कर रहे हैं वो उसके लिए ये गवर्नमेंट की रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी एंड दोज पीपल हु हैव अथॉरिटी टू ट्राई एंड एजुकेट हेल्प देम ग्रैपल विद इट एक जिससे कहते हैं नजिंग दैम इन द राइट डायरेक्शन एजुकेशन जनरली तो होनी चाहिए ना हमारी बिगेस्ट प्रॉब्लम तो ये ऑफकोर्स वी हैव Uh, literacy problem in Pakistan, khas taur pe, you know, we have the largest number of uh, children out of school in the world, which is a huge embarrassment, I think. Uh, so first of all, to hum wo karein ek cheez ke bhi basic education agar aap padhaye, uske andar basic education ke andar you can have also environmental education. Maine to ye bolke kaha hai ki required honi chahiye koi module we have on basic environmental education. और इसके लिए बहुत सारे इदारे इसलिए मैं कह रहा हूँ मैं अपनी किताब की भी रॉयल्टीज इसलिए डोनेट कर रहा हूँ तो आई थिंक दैट इज द वे फॉरवर्ड बट देर आर सम डिसीजन जो पीपल कैन मेक बेसिकली लाइक आप उन्हें सिविक एजुकेशन में अगर ये दें कि भाई एक आप चीज री यूज करें सिंपल थिंग्स लाइक दैट मटीरियल री यूज जो है यू नो हर दफा आप उसको इवन जो प्लास्टिक कप्स हैं या कुछ उनको रीयूज करें क्योंकि सिंपल थिंग्स ये चीजें तो आप लोगों को किसी को भी समझा सकते हैं या तो इवन टिकटॉक वीडियोस पे एजुकेशन कैंपेन हो सकती है इसके लिए इवन स्कूल्स में करने की जरूरत नहीं है तो ये मैंने ये भी इनको कहा था बल्कि एक मैंने हमारे जो सारे ड्रामे एक्टर्स वाले लोग हैं इनको कहा था कि भाई ये दे शुड ट्राई टू मेक दीज काइंड ऑफ 
शॉर्ट वीडियोस जो आम लोग देखते हैं कि उनकी उनमें शूर पैदा हो कैंपेन्स इस तरह की करें और कुछ करते हैं लाइक वर्ल्ड रिसाइकलिंग डे पे को कर देगा या उस तरह की बट इट नीड्स टू बी डन एट अ मच हायर लेवल और ये अच्छा दूसरा आपका जो तो ये है दैट्स माय रिस्पांस टू दैट इज के यू नीड मल्टीपल लेवल्स ऑफ लिटरेसी बट इट यू कांट जस्ट शिफ्ट द बर्डन आल्सो गवर्नमेंट का ये रोल है टू मेक श्योर के दोज इश्यूज आर डेल्ट विद सेकंड जो ये आप लिक्विड ट्रीज का कह रही है ना ये दिस इज वन ऑफ मेनी सोल्यूशन ये बेसिकली इट्स लिक्विड ट्री का है जी के वो आप कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड को सिक्वेस्टर कर रहे हैं थ्रू टेक्नोलॉजिकल मैकेनिज्म uh jo uh, you know develop kiya gaya hai but uh, it's it, it's too much of a technological solution for i think what we are uh, aimed at doing yeah serbia mein belgrade mein hua hai other places they have used them i think basic hamari jo situation hai with reference to and that is just focused on the carbon issue na humne we have to think about a lot of our other problems in pakistan i mean aap dekhen mere mere andaaz mein is waqt jo sabse badi jo coupling hai problem is air and water pollution and air pollution is going to be linked to climate change too so usme agar aap usse sahi handle kare usse aapki climate mein bhi behtar halaat ho sakte hain um so वाटर पोल्यूशन मैं मतलब बहुत देर से ये कह रहा हूँ कि पाकिस्तान के नंबर वन प्रॉब्लम इज वी हैव इन्वायरमेंटल प्रॉब्लम इज दैट वी हैव नॉट बिन एबल टू डेवलप अ गुड हाइड्रोलॉजिकल ऑर्डर यू नो पानी को आपने किस तरह बेहतर इस्तेमाल करना है वी हैव मेड द रावी रिवर इन टू अर वी आर अब वो इतना बड़ा रावी डेवलपमेंट प्लान कर रहे हैं लाहौर में जो उन्होंने मतलब बहुत एम्बिशन हैं मे बी उसके थ्रू आई होप दे विल ऑल्सो लुक इन टू दैट मेरा बल्कि वो स्कूल का क्लास फेलो एक है जो uh, उसमें वो काम कर रहा है एंड आई एम ट्राइंग टू हेल्प दैम मगर अभी वो लेट सी अब क्या होता है पोलिटिकल सिचुएशन थोड़ी स्टेबलाइज हो तो होपफुली सो एंड जो हमारी सैनिटेशन प्रॉब्लम है मे आई बोल जो मैंने जिस तरह इस्लामाबाद का कहा है कि इतने ई सेवन जैसे जो हाइस्ट प्रॉपर्टी वैल्यू एरियाज ऑफ पाकिस्तान है वहाँ भी क्यों अभी तक गंदे नाले बह रहे हैं आई कॉन्ट अंडरस्टैंड वाई अब आप इतनी रिंग रोडें बना रहे हैं क्या कुछ कर रहे हैं बट आप ये नहीं कर सकते कि कवर्ड सुअर्स बना दें विच आर बोथ वाटर सैनिटेशन प्रॉब्लम अपनी जगह हेल्थ प्रॉब्लम हेल्थ के लिए कितना खतरनाक है वो Uh, और अभी तक नहीं वो हम कर सके हैं कितनी देर बाद वो मुझे याद है लाहौर में जफर अली रोड पे होता था नाला जहाँ अमेरिकन कॉन्सुलेट हुआ करती थी आप लाहौर वाले पता नहीं इधर हैं कोई या नहीं मगर वो फाइनली उन्होंने वो दे फाइनली उसको कवर कर दिया था जो किया मगर बाकी सारे लाहौर में बेड़ा गर्क हुआ हुआ इन, इन चीज़ों का वाटर सैनिटेशन इज नॉट लुक डैट बिकॉज वो हालांकि हाइड्रोलॉजिकल ऑर्डर में अर्थली ऑर्डर में आई मैंशन इट्स अ फंडामेंटल एस्पेक्ट यू नो बिकॉज पानी पर वी ऑल डिपेंड Uh, we have not adverted to it. So दरख्त वगैरह तो अपनी जगह है मगर दरख्त भी बेहतर हो जाएंगे अगर वी इम्प्रूव यू नो सम ऑफ दीज एयर के बारे में यू नो वी डोंट डेटा पे नहीं हम जाते हैं अब आप पॉलिटिशंस की बात कर रहे थे ना पॉलिटिशन से आप एयर क्वालिटी की बात करें वो कहेंगे जी वो इंडिया में दिवाली हो रही है उसकी वजह से सारा धुआं आ गया अब भाई आप ऑडिट देखें ये तो उससे नहीं आया है अगर आप दे या वो फार्मर्स को ब्लेम कर देंगे जी कि वो सारा वो भूसा जला रहे हैं उसकी वजह से सारे आ गई है फॉग इसलिए हो रही है भाई आप देखें एफ ने पोल्यूशन ऑडिट किए हैं पाकिस्तान में मोस्ट ऑफ द स्मॉग इन इन पाकिस्तान अर्बन सेंटर्स ड्यूरिंग विंटर इज अ कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ कोर्स ऑफ द वेदर बिकॉज यू हैव कॉन्डेंसेशन है फॉग बट ट्रांसपोर्ट रिलेटेड पोल्यूशन इज द बिगेस्ट कंट्रीब्यूटर हमारी जो रिक्शे गाड़ियाँ और वो पहले सीएनजी का अच्छा टाइम थोड़ा बताया था वो भी बेड़ा गर्क उसका भी हो गया तो उसके बाद से फिर वो बैक टू पेट्रोलियम एंड डीजल एंड दैट इज द सिंगल बिगेस्ट सोर्स ऑफ द स्मॉग पर्टिकुलेट्स व्हिच आर ऑफ कोर्स इन विंटर बिकॉज ऑफ कोल्ड वेदर बिकम्स वर्स बट हम वो कभी इधर वो बेचारे किसानों पर ब्लेम डाल रहे हैं कभी दिवाली वालों पर डाल रहे हैं बट डेटा नहीं देख रहे हालांकि डेटा है हमारे सामने आप उसको रेगुलेट करें ट्रांसपोर्ट सेक्टर को आप अब यू नो सो ये हम दीज आर द काइंड्स ऑफ थिंग्स व्हिच कैन मेक अ डिफरेंस जी और जी जाहिर साहब आप कुछ पूछना चाह रहे थे जाहिर आई थिंक आई थिंक आई मैं ज्यादा वक्त नहीं लेना चाहता लेकिन इस इसी सवाल की एक और डायमेंशन ये है कि देखें जो आपके बुक का स्कोप है आई थिंक इट्स मोर ऑफ अ ग्लोबल स्केल तो और जो जो कार्बन फुटप्रिंट है इंडिविजुअल का 
अगर आप डेटा कंपेयर करें तो जो गरीब मुल्क है जो ग्लोबल साउथ है उसमें इंडिविजुअल का कार्बन फुटप्रिंट रिलेटिवली बहुत कम है एक डेवलप्ड कंट्री के इंडिविजुअल से द अमाउंट ऑफ एजेंट्स एंड लाइफ यूज अब लोकलाइज लोकल पोल्यूशन प्रॉब्लम्स तो हमारे यहाँ ऑफकोर्स हैं लेकिन अगर हम ग्लोबली क्लाइमेट के साथ हारमोनी पैदा करना चाहते हैं तो हाउ यू सी के डेवलप्ड कंट्रीज का जो इंडिविजुअल है वहाँ पे पर कार्बन फुटप्रिंट को कैसे रिड्यूस किया जाए नहीं मैं तो इस मामले में यू नो एंड आई सर्व ऑन टू यू एन पैनल प्रॉब्लम हर चीज कार्बन पे डाल दी है ऑल इन्वायरमेंटल प्रॉब्लम आर नॉट कार्बन प्रॉब्लम एंड सो मैं तो उनको ये कहता हूँ कि भाई आप पाकिस्तान को इन ममालिक को जो सफ़र कर रहे हैं ऑफकोर्स यू फोकस ऑन देयर एडेप्टशन स्ट्रेटजीज एंड सो ऑन जहाँ पे विन विन ऑप्शन हैं जिस तरह ये मैंने एयर पोल्यूशन का कहा है कि अगर आप अगर आप रिड्यूस करेंगे कार यूसेज इन पाकिस्तान और यू इम्प्रूव द इमिशन ऑफ कार्स यू हैव बेटर पोल्यूशन करो उससे कार्बन बेनिफिट भी होगा मगर उसका प्राइमरी बेनिफिट है कि आपकी एयर क्वालिटी बेहतर होगी यू हैव हंड्रेड्स ऑफ थाउजेंड ऑफ पीपल हु हैव प्रेमेच्योर डेथ बिकॉज ऑफ एयर पोल्यूशन इन पाकिस्तान वाई एंड वो आप उस पर फोकस करें एंड उससे अगर कार्बन बेनिफिट आते हैं तो ठीक है सो मेरा जो है ना अर्थली ऑर्डर का पार्ट ऑफ इट इज इज सिस्टम्स परस्पेक्टिव यू कैन नॉट आप हमारी टेंडेंसी है रिडक्शन इस परस्पेक्टिव की कार्बन ले लिया तो कार्बन पे अड़ गए वो सारे डोनर्स कार्बन के पीछे पड़ गए दूसरा कभी इसीलिए फिर वो दरख्तों पे आ जाएंगे सुनामियां ला रहे हैं दरख्तों की बिकॉज वो सारा कुछ कार्बन के ऊपर ही फोकस हो गया ठीक है अच्छा है इंपॉर्टेंट है आई मीन मेरा हमारी फैमिली का मरी में घर एंड आई सीन के वहाँ पे दरख्तों की a forestation has been a very positive thing you know you have actually improved the situation by having tree planting but you, it it's part of a much bigger complex equation of how we are going to solve environmental problems so and then the other thing in earthly order i do talk about is that you need to have you know hum kehte hain na think globally act locally you need to have multiple tiers of Uh, implementation you have to think globally act globally and think locally and act uh, locally yeah. because it's a nested system so yeah for sure it's a small yes sir of course ji yeah thank you uh, dr yes, asif maila sahib aur asif sahib dr asif hai aur shumaila hai ji acha ji dr ji assalam alaikum assalam alaikum abhi afshan ne kaha tha ke एक कामनर जो है वो किस तरह इन्वायरमेंट में कंट्रीब्यूट कर सकता है जी। तो मेरा ख्याल है कि इन्वायरमेंट की रिस्पांसिबिलिटी ही कामनर की है जब तक एज ए नेशन हम लोग कंट्रीब्यूट नहीं करेंगे एज एन इंडिविजुअल मैं कंट्रीब्यूट नहीं करूंगा तो मेरा इन्वायरमेंट प्रोडक्ट होने नहीं जा रहा जी गवर्नमेंट कोई भी डिसीजन कर आज लाहौर में गवर्नमेंट ने डिसीजन किया कि ट्रांसपोर्ट बंद रहेगी और तीन दो तीन छुट्टियां दे दी लेकिन पब्लिक ने कंप्लायंस नहीं दी और पब्लिक जब कंप्लायंस नहीं देती तो गवर्नमेंट पॉलिसी जो है वो उसी वक्त फेलियर में चली जाती है तो मेरा ख्याल है कि जरूरी ये है कि पब्लिक की कोई इस पे इंक्लूजन हो और पब्लिक में अवेयरनेस इसके लिए बहुत जरूरी होगी सेकेंडली क्या था कि हम किस तरह कंट्रीब्यूट कर सकते हैं और नेचर में मेरा ख्याल है कि जब हम कंट्रीब्यूट नहीं करते तो नेचर आप खुद ही एक प्रोएक्टिव मैयर लेती है और जो इन्वायरमेंट है ये कोई एक जगह की एक मुकाम की एंटिटी नहीं है बल्कि यूनिवर्सली इन्वायरमेंट जो है कनेक्टेड है अगर हम देखें कि बहुत सारी चीजें मैंने आज एक डॉक्यूमेंट्री देखी नेटफ्लिक्स पे कनेक्टेड के नाम से वो एक इजिप्शियन साइंटिस्ट है नासिर के नाम से तो उसने कहा जी के सहारा से कुछ रेत उठती है आ, और वो जाके अमेजोन के जंगल में जाके गिरती है और उसको उसने टेक्निकली प्रूव किया नैसा के डिफरेंट वर्जन के साथ उसने कहा कि सहा चूंकि वहां पे एक डेफिशिएंसी होती है कि रेनफॉल बहुत ज्यादा होता है और वहां से फॉरस्पोरस ड्रेन आउट होता है और जो सहारन डस्ट है उसमें फॉरस्पोरस होता है और वो वहां पे फीड कर रही होती है तो नेचर खुद ही प्रोक्टिव मैयर ले रही होती है जब हम नेचर के अगेंस्ट करेंगे तो फिर वो नेचर 
थोड़ा सा ऐसा एडवर्स मैयर लेती है जो शायद हमारे लिए ठीक नहीं होता थैंक यू जी नहीं वो ये एड्रेस हरा वाले एग्जांपल है वो तो मैंने आपको मैंने कह उसमें मेंशन किया अर्ली ऑर्डर में दैट्स एन एग्जांपल ऑफ हाउ यू नो यू हैव कनेक्शंस बिटवीन बायोम्स ऑन द प्लैनेट सो वो तो दैट इज डेफिनेटली द केस एंड दैट्स वन ऑफ द ग्रेट यू नो इंपॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ प्लैनेटरी सिस्टम्स एंड व्हाई वी नीड टू हैव अ ग्लोबल अप्रोच दैट्स व्हाई वी नीड इंटरनेशनल एनवायरमेंटल ट्रीटी एंड सो ऑन बट जो दूसरा आपका पॉइंट है ना कि लोग करेंगे ये मैं ये अर्ज करूँ कि इसमें बेशक आप कह रहे हैं कि एट वन लेवल तो इंडिविजुअल्स हैव टू चेंज बिहेवियर बट वो इंडिविजुअल्स की इन मैनी केसेस इंडिविजुअल्स आर इट्स वेरी डिफिकल्ट फॉर देम टू चेंज बिहेवियर अनलेस दे आर नज टू डू सो एंड इट्स द रोल ऑफ गवर्नमेंट इट्स द रोल ऑफ कल्चर इन वेरियस फॉर्म्स टू टू नज दैम इन दैट डायरेक्शन and where where they are actually violating the law you have to enforce the law so if the government does not have capacity to enforce the law that is then a problem so ab aap jo bhi behavioral changes europe mein aayi hain in many cases they have been a result of regulation actually and enforcement of regulation ab uh, unka european union ke sabse zyada environmental directives hain and if someone does not abide by them then you have unfortunately you know it, economics when we say environmental behavior is a, is a classic externality you know their firms don't have an incentive to do it unless you get regulation through it so regulation has an absolutely imperative role in shepherding that wo aap jitna bhi logon ka behavior badalne ki koshish kare individuals ki wo nahi hoga because incentive system hi nahi bana hua hai for our own individual behavior it's a problem jise hum kehte hain na the लॉजिक ऑफ कलेक्टिव एक्शन एक मैंनेमिस्ट था उसकी किताब है बड़ी मशहूर इसके ऊपर वी डोंट हैव दैट और इंडिविजुअली अगर आप इवन अमरत्या सैन ने बड़ा मशहूर वो कहा था कि अगर सब सिर्फ आप लोगों को करने दें इन अ लिबरल सोसाइटी विल नेवर हैव ऑप्टमैलिटी एंड आई टॉक अबाउट दिस इन दिस इन द बुक ही रोट अ पेपर कॉल्ड द इम्पॉसिबिलिटी ऑफ अपरेटी एंड लिबरल दैट इन अ टोटली लिबरल सोसाइटी जहां आप कह रहे हैं कि सब लोग ही कर लेंगे उनको आप उनको आप इंफॉर्मेशन दें वो सब ऑप्टिमल सोसाइटी होगी सो दैट्स वाई रेगुलेशन का बड़ा इंपॉर्टेंट रोल है वो बड़ी जरूरी है उनसे आप पूछें उनसे राय लें कि भाई क्या चीज आपके लिए आसान होगी करनी वो आप बिल्कुल सही कह रहे हैं कि यू नीड अ प्रोसेस के गवर्नमेंट आल्सो नीड्स टू इट्स व्हाट वी कॉल इट डायलेक्टिक यू नो यू गो बैक एंड फोर्थ बिटवीन द गवर्नमेंट अच्छा अब तो बहुत सारे हाथ आ गए सो लेट्स टेक कलेक्टिवली क्वेश्चन सब के हम ले लेते हैं देन आई विल ट्राई टू एड्रेस जी शुमाइल अब प्लीज सर बहुत अच्छी टॉक थी आपकी और मेरा तालुक लाहौर से है और मैं जो है वो स्मोक को क्योंकि मैं एलर्जी की पेशेंट हूँ तो स्मोक जो है वो बहुत ज्यादा डायरेक्टली असरअंदाज हो रही है Um, uh, मेरा सवाल ये है कि गवर्नमेंट ने देखे अब ये जैसे सोल्यूशन निकाला उसका कि फोर दिन का यहाँ पे फोर डेज का लॉकडाउन है तो वो कितना मतलब क्या ये uh, मैयर जो उन्होंने लिया है आपके ख्याल में वो कितना फायदा मंद है हमारे लिए या ये क्या राइट डिसीजन है मैंने आज मेरा बाहर निकलना हुआ तो सड़कों पे तो ट्रैफिक वैसे ही है बेशक वो उन्होंने मॉल्स uh, बंद किए हैं या कारोबार बंद किए हैं या इदारे बंद किए हैं लेकिन लोग तो वैसे ही बाहर रोड के ऊपर थे और वैसे ही और स्मोक और इन्वायरमेंट उतना ही बुरा हाल है जितना के मतलब पहले है। तो आ, सवाल मेरा ये कि ये क्या सही है उनका ये स्टेप जी मैं भी मैं, मैं, सारे सुन के फिर मैं बोलता हूँ आप कीजिए क्वेश्चन डॉक्टर साहब याद रहेंगे आपको इतने सवाल इकट्ठे जी जी मैं लिख लेता हूँ हाँ जी मैं लिख लेता हूँ चले ठीक हो गया जी फरमाइए साथ साथ थैंक यू डॉक्टर सलीम फॉर द वंडरफुल टॉक अच्छा मेरा क्वेश्चन ये है कि एक ही पर्टिकुलर बात है जो मेरे जहन में अक्सर आती है वन एवर मैं किसी के इन्वायरमेंटलिस्ट को बात करते हुए सुनता हूँ जो कि ग्लोबल वार्मिंग और इस चीज पे बात कर रहे होते हैं कि जो मैयर्स वो सजेस्ट करते हैं इवन जो बेयर मिनिमम मैयर्स हैं हमारे सर्वाइवल के लिए वो इतने इम्प्रैक्टिकल होते हैं इम्प्रैक्टिकल इन देंस के considering the current pace that we are moving at right jab aapki talk chal rahi thi to main dr ilhan nayas ki book hai down for lessons for our final century wo mere zehn se chal rahi thi maine recently padhi aur wo ek dystopian picture badi paint karte hain futures ki 
और जो बेयर मिनिमम मेयर वो सजेस्ट करते हैं सर्वाइवल के वो इतने इम्प्रैक्टिकल हैं राइट हम बात कर रहे हैं एजुकेशन के और यू नो ग्रीनरी की और ट्रीज की और सस्टेनेबल मटेरियल्स की बट जो दुनिया के सबसे एजुकेटेड कंट्रीज हैं इस टाइम वहाँ वो नाइन्टी नाइन परसेंट कार्बन फुटप्रिंट है वो प्रोड्यूस कर रहे हैं जो वहां पे वे पॉलिटिशन हैं वो अनरिपेंटेंट ग्रोथ से हम दूर नहीं हो रहे जो वेपन आपका मिलिट्री इंडस्ट्रियल कॉम्प्लेक्स है वो है तो बेसिकली मेरा क्वेश्चन ये है कि हम टिपिंग पॉइंट की बात कर रहे हैं लेकिन जो is it practical can we stop our destruction before the tipping point because jab bhi main kisi environmentalist ko baat karte hue sunta hu jo bare minimum wo suggest karte hain wo bhi impractical lagta hai to kindly is pe thoda comment kijiyega nahi i'll address that sir thank you ji sir ji dr shazia aur amna aap bhi apne question please bataiye fir dr saab se kehte hain address ji dr shazia असलम जी थैंक यू फॉर योर टॉक मेरा सवाल इस अबाउट जो आपने वो डोनट हमें दिखाया था ना जिसमें सम हाउ वी हैव दिस एनवायरमेंटल नेचुरल कॉन्स्ट्रेंट और विद इन द कॉन्स्ट्रेंट जो सोसाइटी जिस तरह से और बहुत सारी चीजें हैं दैट वी नीड टू लुक इनटू द इशू इज के चेंज आएगा कहाँ से टू वी नीड टू आपने कहा ना कि वी नीड टू अर्थली ऑर्डर के अंदर वी नीड टू ऑपरेट Uh, लेकिन जब हम सोसाइटी uh, की बात करते हैं और जब हम चेंज की बात करते हैं कि सो अगर चेंज सोसाइटी से नहीं आएगा uh, तो बाहर से उसको इम्प्लीमेंट करना इट्स वेरी डिफिकल्ट क्योंकि सम हाउ अगर जैसे हम अपनी सोसाइटीज ऑर्गेनाइज करते हैं uh, उसी तरह से सोसाइटी सर्टन uh, शेप ले लेती है ना पावर डायनामिक्स होते हैं सोसाइटी के गवर्नमेंट्स भी उसी तरह बनती हैं तो अगर uh, हमारी सोसाइटी में पावर इम्बैलेंस इतना है और हम गवर्नमेंट्स को ही सारा रोल दे रहे हैं रेगुलेशन का पॉलिसीज uh, बनाने का डू यू थिंक गवर्नमेंट उस तरह से प्रोटेक्ट कर सकती है कहीं हमें लीड कर सकती है बिकॉज सम हाउ वो अगर आप फेमिनिस्ट का भी वो देखें ना क्रिटिसिजम जो है इन्वायरमेंटल थ्योरीज के ऊपर के सम हाउ जब तक आप सोसाइटीज को नहीं चेंज करेंगे वो माइंड सेट नहीं चेंज होगा वो पावर इम्बेलेंस तब तक शायद हम जिधर जाना चाह रहे हैं ना वर्थली ऑर्डर जिसकी आप बात करें वो स्टैब्लिश करना इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट और राइट नाउ तो हमें दुनिया में कहीं पर भी नजर नहीं आता हमें पावर इम्बेलेंस हर जगह ही नजर आता है सो उसको हम सरकमेंट करेंगे जी अस्सलाम वालेकुम डॉक्टर सलीम आपकी बहुत अच्छी टॉक थी मेरा फर्स्ट एक्सपीरियंस है ये आप लोगों के साथ तो मुझे बड़ा अच्छा लगा सारी टॉक सुन के और जितनी मेंबर्स थे उनकी डिस्कशन और कमेंट्स तो सर मेरे कमेंट्स से समझ लें या अगर क्वेश्चन इनको ले सकें तो आप ग्लोबली मोस्टली यहाँ इशू हो रहा है कि डिस्कस uh, हो रहा है कि हम ग्लोबली कैसे इसको कह ले कर सकते हैं इसको कैसे ला सकते हैं जो भी इन्वायरमेंटल इशू आ रहे हैं सर so, मैं थोड़ा सा ना फिल्टराइजेशन की तरफ जाऊंगी कि अगर हम लोकली देखें यहाँ लोकली भी कमेंट्स आए थे आई थिंक डॉक्टर आसिफ अगर मैं नेम से ले रही हूँ डॉक्टर आरिफ के तो सर लोकली मेरा रिसेंटली मैं कल घर पहुँची हूँ मेरा गाँव में विजिट था सर uh, विलेज uh, में हालाँकि हम कहते हैं कि बड़ी कह लें ताज़ा हवा होती है बड़ा वहाँ पुरसकून सा माहौल होता है लेकिन सर वहाँ अभी तक गंदगी की वही कंडीशन है सीवरेज की वही कंडीशन है और वहाँ मेरी नज़र में जो मैंने चीज़ अब तक ऑब्जर्व की विलेजेस में अगर देखा जाए तो एक तो वहाँ तक ना जो वहाँ के नुमाइंदे होते हैं हुकूमत के अः के वहाँ वो वहाँ होते हैं लेकिन वो बड़ा नाम होते हैं यानी वो वसाइल वहाँ तक उतने नहीं ला पाते मिलना तो खैर वो पॉलिटिकल सिचुएशन पे हम नहीं जाएंगे लेकिन वो वसाइल वहाँ तक नहीं लाते वो लोगों को यही कहते हैं कि हमें ग्रांड नहीं मिल रही ये नहीं मिल रहा ये वो नहीं मिल रहा अगर सोशल इम्पेक्ट के बारे में थोड़ा सा डिस्कस करें तो मेरे ख्याल में एक इम्पेक्ट थोड़ा ये होना चाहिए कि अगर हम कहें ना कि गवर्नमेंट हम पे उस चीज़ को जो है वो स्ट्रिक्टली हमें कहे कि हमें इसको फॉलो करना चाहिए एग्जैक्टली exactly गवर्नमेंट को ये करना चाहिए लेकिन कुछ हमारा अपना जो रोल है वो वो हमारा बहुत बड़ा किरदार है जैसे आ, हम इन्वायरमेंटल इश्यूज की या ग्लोबल इश्यूज की या कोई भी सोशल इश्यू की बात करें तो वो चीज़ हमारे घर से स्टार्ट होती है ठीक है हम बहुत बड़े लेवल पे नहीं जाते लेकिन एक माइनर लेवल पे कह लें कि तरबियत आपकी जो होती है वहाँ से शुरू होती है घर के बाद अगर हम बाहर निकलें तो वो लोग जिनकी हम बात सुनते हैं जैसे हमारे जो मर्द हजरात हैं वो मसाजिद जाते हैं औरतें जो होती हैं वो बच्चियाँ जो होती हैं उनको कुरान पाक पढ़ाने के लिए 
مدارس میں بھیجا جاتا ہے یا کسی خاتون کے ہاں بھیجا جاتا ہے اس کے بعد اگر ہم اس سے اگلے لیول پہ جائیں تو ہم اسکولز میں جاتے ہیں کالجز میں جاتے ہیں یونیورسٹیز میں جاتے ہیں تو میرے خیال میں پیرنٹس اور آپ کی فیملی کے بعد آپ نے بہت زیادہ خاص طور پہ پاکستان میں in that because Pakistan has a very strong religious culture and uh, so I have made an environmental curriculum for Pakistan for a long time ago and we had tried to make this at this grassroots level and I will give an example of Indonesia is a very good example of their Pisantran which is their religious uh, institutions ان میں انہوں نے بڑے اچھا انوائرمنٹل ایجوکیشن کریکولم کیا ہے سو پاکستان شوڈ لرن فرام آلسو یہ جو گراس روٹس ایفرٹ کلچرل چینج آن انوائرمنٹ انڈونیشیا اینڈ ملیشیا ہیو ڈن اے ویری گڈ جاب ملیشیا آلسو ہیز ویری ہائی لیول آف انوائرمنٹل پرفارمنس انڈیکس ان دیٹ سو یہ تو ہو گیا آمنا کا کوسٹ کامنٹ ٹو ایڈریس دین آئی ول موو آن ٹو ڈاکٹر شازیہ کا جو کامنٹ ہے اباؤٹ دا ڈونٹ ہاؤ ٹو گیٹ ٹو اسٹے ود ان دا ڈونٹ یو نو دیر آر ناؤ اٹ گوز ڈاؤن ٹو میٹرکس اینڈ ہاؤ یو میک گورنمنٹ ڈسیزن بیسڈ آن میٹرکس ایمسٹرڈیم ایز اے سٹی از یوزنگ ڈونٹ اکنامکس ایز اے وے آف ایکچولی چارٹنگ دیئر پالیسیز اینڈ سو دیر آر ایگزامپلس ویئر گورنمنٹس وین دے آر ایبل ٹو میجر انہوں نے کہا جی ہم سوشل فاؤنڈیشن بھی میجر کر رہے ہیں پلانیٹری باؤنڈریز بھی میجر کر رہے ہیں اینڈ اس کے بیسس پہ ہم ڈسیزن لے رہے ہیں کہ کہاں ہم گھر کہاں پر پلاننگ پرمیشن کہاں دیں گے نئی ایکسپینشن کی سو آن اینڈ سو فور سو کی از میجرمنٹ اینڈ دین لنکنگ ڈسیزن ٹو میجرمنٹ اینڈ ہمارے مطلب پاکستان میں وی آر گیٹنگ مچ بیٹر ایٹ ڈیٹا کلیکشن ان ٹرمز آف انوائرمنٹل انڈیکیٹرز اینڈ سو آن اینڈ آئی ایم ہوپ فل دیٹ دس کین بی ڈن اٹ ول ٹیک ٹائم یہ صرف ڈیولپڈ کنٹریز کی بات نہیں ہے ڈیولپنگ کنٹریز میں بھی ہوا ہے کولمبیا میں شہر ہے میڈین وچ وز یو نو کولمبیا میں پاکستان سے بہت ملتے جلتے حالات ہیں ادھر بھی اندر ان کے ایکسٹریمسٹ گروپس بھی ہیں بم بھی پھٹتے ہیں ہر قسم کے مسائل ہیں کوکین بھی چل رہی ہے لوگ غربت بھی ہے سارا کچھ میں گیا ہوں کولمبیا میں اور بٹ پھر بھی دے ہیو سم ریئلی سسٹینیبل سٹیز دے آر میکنگ اٹ ورک اینڈ سو وی شوڈ لرن فرام کنٹریز لائک کولمبیا وی شوڈ لرن فرام سم آف دیز پلیسز جہاں یہ گورننس جو ہے نا ڈونٹ اکنامکس اپروچ کام کر رہی ہے سعد کا کوشچن اباؤٹ ام پریکٹیکلٹی جی دیر وی ہیو ٹو میں اب آئی ایم اے پریگمٹسٹ یو نو ایز سم ون ہو از اے پلانر پی ایچ ڈی ان پلاننگ مینس دیٹ پلانرز آر اباؤٹ میکنگ سولوشنس اینڈ looking to the future. So I totally agree that there are places we have reached a tipping point and there's no point trying to change behavior on mitigation. We have to adapt. And earthly order actually is make lesson I'm an elikana. Order can be discovered and invented. Invented means that you have to recognize that we up to add the, the train has left the station. Up humne dekna aage hum kis trans adapt current to a changing situation. So we will need to And environmentalists have a problem here because they're very utopian uh, and they don't want to adapt. And the reason is what they call the moral hazard problem. Moral hazard problem is that if you say, oh, no, it's not going to happen, it's going to happen. But the technology will solve it, so they don't prevent it, right? So that's why the moral hazard of the environmentalists, which are afraid to say, so they usually do it. But I think that we have to balance it. مارل ہیزڈ اپنی جگہ ہے بٹ یو ول نیڈ ٹو فگر آؤٹ ایڈیپٹیشن اور میں میں اسی لیے یہ کلائمیٹ چینج کے اوپر بھی اب نائنٹی پرسینٹ آف فائنانس آن کلائمیٹ از گون آن میٹیگیشن دیٹ ہیز ٹو چینج اٹ ہیز ٹو فوکس آن ایڈیپٹیشن بیکاز اب لوگوں کا بہیویئر بدلا نہیں جا سکتا جیسے آپ کہہ رہے ہیں اٹس ان پریکٹیکل ایک دم سے ہم ٹرانزیشن اوے فرام فاسل فیول اب نہیں کر سکیں گے اینڈ اس میں بھی میں نے ریسرچ جو کی ہے آن ایون دا مٹیریل نیکسس فار ٹرانزیشن از ٹو ڈیفیکلٹ سولر اینرجی ونڈ کے لیے یو نیڈ انامس انفراسٹرکچر آف مٹیریلس وچ وی ول ناٹ بی ایبل ٹو ڈو اینڈ سو وی نیڈ ٹو اڈیپٹ ٹو سم میکسچر یہ نہیں میں کہہ رہا کہ سولر نہ کریں سولر ونڈ کریں مگر 
don't be idealistic about how much it can achieve. So I agree with you on that. Um, and then uh, the fi final question uh, from Shumaila, I think uh, was on the car uh, policy issues in Lahore, ke aap, uh, 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 jo concerns hai about whether this is going to work or not. You know, this is a very short-term policy change. This is just a reactive thing. We are still in the situation. You know, the patient has come in emergency, you are giving them CPR, hai, tang, wo, that is one thing. But you have to see why the patient has been first of all. Now, if you are closing this, the patient has been studied in the CPR in the emergency room. We have to see why the patient has been first of all. Now, the patient's diagnosis वो हमने देखना है longer term issues हैं हमने अपनी urban planning कैसे की हमने क्यों एक cities को cars के ऊपर ज़्यादा focus रखा आ, हमने क्यों वो जो doxiadis की vision थी इस्लामाबाद की can that be reinvented अब जो नई developments हैं लाहौर की they need to be developed with that kind of smart planning ताकि आपको you de incentivize people from using transport in the same way. I mean, the, the public uh, mass transit is a good example. If we can get more people to use mass transit and we have more accessibility of mass transit, that will make a difference with car uh, pollution. But it's lumbi longer term. Hai, abhi diagnostic level. Pe kar the other one which immediately can do that you can enforce the cars whose emissions and particulates are so high level, pe, unko ja ke chalan kare, take them off the street. You know, that, that is what's going to solve the problem in the long run. Abhi itne sare wo jo hai, abha wo kare di gareeb loog hai, bichare wo rikshe wale ke kya karenge. Well, that's the government's responsibility to then figure out ke bhi unko koji subsidy dayen ke wo apna catalytic converters lagayen apne rikshon pe ya jo bhi cheez hai. That has to be done. Or jo baaki itne paise ring roadon pe laga rahe hai, wo ring roadon ke achha ban gai hai. It's a good thing to some degree. Magar ab future planning kare dono side hoon pe. Use some of the money towards that. Taki aapki pollution control ho at the source. Okay. Thank you. Doshar, Doshar, bhoat shukriya. Yeh jo saad ka jo concern hai na, inko mene zabardasti wo kitab padhai thi. Dr. Ilhan Niaz ki review bhi karwaya tha. तो उसके बाद से ना काफी वो लगता है कि भई ये हम तो दुनिया खत्म हो रही है और कोई सलूशन नहीं है अच्छा दूसरा ये है कि हमें जो लगता है ना इस्लामाबाद में के इम्प्रैक्टिकल सलूशंस है मैंने काफी दफा ऐसी तस्वीरें बनाई ऐसी गाड़ियों की जो शायद दूसरी जंगे अजीम की हैं और वो इतना पोल्यूशन छोड़ रही होती है इस्लामाबाद पुलिस कुछ नहीं करती और ये जो ट्रैफिक को बाइकर्स जो है ना जिस तरह के कर्तव्य करते हैं वो भी डिसिप्लिन नहीं हो सके तो हमें लगता है कि यहाँ पे इन्फोर्समेंट जो है उसमें बिल्कुल कोई हो बचा नहीं है बिल्कुल सही आप कह रहे हैं और इन्फोर्समेंट कैपेसिटी है पाकिस्तान में अगर वो करना चाहें वो लोगों को जेल में डालने में तो बड़ी इन्फोर्समेंट बड़ी जल्दी इनकी हो गई थी जब करना था करने को तो कर सकते हैं कोई ये नहीं है कि जी वो हम कर नहीं सकते कोविड में पाकिस्तान डिड वेरी वेल पाकिस्तान ने बल्कि मिसाली तौर पे उनको एग्जांपल यूएन देती है क्योंकि एनफोर्समेंट बड़ी अच्छी थी सड़कें बंद कर देते थे जब वो होता था यू नो और बड़ी उन्होंने अच्छा बैलेंस रखा करने को कर सकते हैं इट्स अ मैटर ऑफ जस्ट गेटिंग द विल टू डू इट अच्छा वो जो एक बात आपने की ना कि पॉलिटिशियन को एजुकेट करें ये भी बड़ा मतलब बड़ा चैलेंजिंग है पॉलिटिशियन को एजुकेट कैसे करें हमारे कॉन्टेक्स्ट में तो ये काफी मतलब नामुमकिनात फिर लगता है वो साथ वाली बात है कि भी कैसे बहुत सारे तो पॉलिटिशियन बड़े पढ़े लिखे भी हैं उनको थोड़ा सा अगर आप अब ये शहरी रहमान डेट अ वेरी गुड जॉब एट द क्लाइमेट चेंज कंट्रीटी मैं कोई मेरी कोई पॉलिटिकल एफिलिएशन नहीं ना मैं किसी पी में हूँ ना किसी एल में हूँ ना किसी में मगर शी डिट अ गुड जॉब you know uh, and i think she is highly educated yahan us ki padhi hui hai ambassador rahi hai is kisam ke log hain you have other abu jo ye you know uh, ali jangir siddiqui the jo yahan pe rahe hain then wo js bank ke you know people like him very well educated were there if you know there there lots of hamare pakistan ki actually environmental movement grassroots mein sayed babar ali ka pehle zikr kar rahe the he was president of wwf a long time ago koi soch bhi nahi sakta tha ki pakistani industrialist wwf ke chair the pure europe duniya mein so you know they, we have had industry people involved daud family extremely dedicated to environment unka magnificent center of karachi mein dekhen kitni unhone 20 million dollars they spent on that 
यू नो सो हमारे अल्लाह का शुक्र है कि बहुत सारे ऐसे लोग हैं थोड़ा सा उनको भी नीड टू फर्दर चैनल पोलिटिकल इन्फ्लुंस उनका हो थैंक यू वेरी मच और हमारे जो पैनलिस्ट है डॉक्टर जाहिद और अली शहबाज और डॉक्टर साजिद आपका भी बहुत शुक्रिया और बाकी जो शुरुआत है उन सबका बहुत शुक्रिया थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सो मच